Welcome to the Dollar Debatcha program, brought to you by Cliff Cool's Notes, a daily consolidator of the most insightful presentations, articles, essays, and the interviews on the web on the ultimate confidence game, money. Our site presents ideas from the smartest and wisest money managers, economists, and analysts. Hi, my name is Monique Rollins. Today we'll be talking with Redmond Weisenberger, one of the founding directors of Mises Institute Canada. As the founder of Mises Institute Canada, what are some of the goals and objectives of the Institute? So I founded the Institute in uh, 2010 mm -hmm. with the objective of sort of spreading the knowledge of the Austrian school throughout Canada. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's, you know, we have the internet now and, and of course, you know, there's Mises Institute down in Albert, Auburn, Alabama, there's Mises Institute around the world. But I thought that uh, a lot of times people want to see um, specifically Canadian issues mm -hmm. tackled from our perspective, yes. right? So, you know, we might have, there might be articles about the Fed, but, you know, a lot of people don't even understand that mm -hmm. we also have a central bank in Canada. It's called, yes. you know, the Bank of Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, it engages in all the same sorts of policies as the Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. It has a sort of same sort of effect on the Canadian economy mm -hmm. that the Federal Reserve does. And to be honest, I mean, I think there's, like around the world, you know, most people uh, sort of know about Keynesianism. You know, mm -hmm. maybe they know about the Chicago School. But right now, there isn't a lot of knowledge about the Austrian School, uh, say, within Canada. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, that's interesting. Uh, what activities does Mises Canada do to reach these goals? So what we've been doing over the last uh, three years, um, so far our main, uh, our main sort of uh, way of reaching the public has been our website, mm -hmm. uh, where, where you can reach it at Mises.ca. Um, we launch, we basically have uh, articles on a daily basis, uh, some pulled from history, most sort of tackling current day issues mm -hmm. about uh, you know, what's going on in Europe, what's going on in Canada, what Mark Carney is saying, because yes. he's now the, of course, Mark Carney, the superstar central banker who has now moved on to uh, head up the, the world's oldest central bank, the Bank of, uh, the bank of England. So, so we do that. Um, today, uh, where you're interviewing me is at U of T, mm -hmm. and we're specifically running the Austrian Scholars Conference um, here. And that, that, what that tries to do is, is bring in students brings in professors from around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got people from the UK, we've got people from the United States nice. uh, flying in to give talks about the Austrian school, about uh, sort of advancing it you know, into the future, growing it. Uh, many students have come out to this event. And then we also run our um, other conferences that sort of will focus on one, one thing or the other, right? Mm -hmm. So we had a conference in, uh, our very first conference was in Calgary, uh, was on oil and resources, yes. mm -hmm. resource economics. Uh, after that, we've had a conference uh, on monetary policy here mm -hmm. in Toronto. Uh, and we're gonna be running uh, into the future, the, in 2014, we're gonna be running a conference on the Fed, uh, mm -hmm. because it's the 100th anniversary of the yes. Federal Reserve. And we're going to be having a conference, um, and we're going to be running a Mises Canada University yes. oh, wow. uh, this summer. So yeah, so yes. we're essentially we're we're trying to reach out to the public in, in many different ways, yes. and yes. we're also looking in the future to uh, start, mm. you know, sort of spreading our message within the media as well. Yes. You yes. know, we've had uh, we've had several pieces in the uh, we've had several opinion pieces in say the Financial Post and yes. the National Post. Yes. Getting the word out there. Yes. Yeah. Uh, why do you think an Austrian economics approach is needed today? Um, well, I think the, well, the thing about Austrian economics, I mean, it's a framework for analyzing mm -hmm. things, right? So when we're talking about economics, um, you know, economics is essentially a value-free science, mm -hmm. right? So in some ways, what we're doing is with the Austrian School of Economics, uh, with this framework for so essentially analyzing today's events, what we can do is we can look at the effects of, say, central bank inflation, yes. look at the effects of, of um, of you know suppressing the interest rate, mm -hmm. um, and then we can we can see what's happening, and then we can say okay, well, should these things be occurring? That's mm -hmm. another question, right? Yes. Uh, the problem today uh, is we largely have the people running the central banks and the people running our monetary system, essentially our central planners to a large mm -hmm. extent, right? They yes. what they see their job is to manipulate the economy of Canada, manipulate the economy of the United States, uh, whatever it is to achieve a certain end, mm -hmm. right? Now the point that we're making, uh, and the, the thing is, is that the tools that they use mm -hmm. to do that essentially don't work as yeah. far as I'm concerned, right? Yeah. Uh, and essentially, so what's been happening over the last 100 years since the formation of the Fed, you've had a series of uh, you know, mainstream economists you know, making predictions, attempting to manipulate the Canadian economy, mm -hmm. attempting to manipulate the American economy, mm -hmm. 
in order to achieve a specific end, it might be something like, uh, well, we need to keep the price of this low. Yes. We need to employ more people. Mm -hmm. We need to do this. We need to do that. Um, but as essentially, what, they, what has happened is that they have been wrong continually mm -hmm. over the, over the uh, last 100 years. Whereas when you look at what the, what the Aust people who work within the Austrian framework, they've successfully predicted what has occurred, mm -hmm. right? And yes. so if we're going to be honest about what's going on in the yeah. economy, if we're going to be honest about um, uh, what the effects of central bank inflation are yeah. on the economy and what the knock-on effects are yeah. to everybody's quality of life, yeah. uh, then I think the Austrian framework yes. is needed. I mean, at a, at a fundamental level, in terms of, um, in mi in terms of microeconomics, mm -hmm. essentially everybody agrees, yes. right? We all agree that, we all agree that, say, you know, supply and demand and, mm -hmm. you yes. know, and all these sorts yes. of on a, on a micro level a person to person level essentially um, you know we all agree mm -hmm. even the Keynesians will, will, won't deny that but the the difference comes is when you move up to the macro level yes. right essentially um, in some ways mac modern macroeconomics started with Keynes mm -hmm. right and so essentially what he's saying or what what I would say the Keynesians are saying is they're saying okay well at the micro level yeah things change, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's sort of, there's different rules all of a sudden. And, um, and so uh, they, they believe that they can do things, like they can change, you know, they can change the law of supply and demand. You know, they, yeah. can, they can create certain outcomes by, again, doing things such as manipulating the money supply, mm -hmm. manipulating interest rates yes. in order to achieve this desired end. Uh, whereas the, the Austrians will say, well, yes, you can do that, but it's highly unlikely yeah. that you'll achieve your desired end, exactly, yes. right? Because, they, because at a certain point, what, these, what the Keynesians are doing, they're creating aggregates, mm -hmm. right? They, don't, they no longer look at the individual. Yeah. They, what they start to do is they start to pull numbers and they start to say, well, look at all these numbers. You know, obviously, we can see that the, you know, the economy is growing, the economy is yes. shrinking, unemployment is up, unemployment is down. But the real problem is, um, and I would argue that they really don't have the ability to know these things. Yeah. They can't know these things. Yes. They can't know. Um, they can't know what the GDP actually is. They can't know. Yeah. You know yeah. they, and and oftentimes the problem, uh, a lot of times, the data that they're using to put into their yes. models is flawed to begin with. Yes. Right. So it's there's a term that you often use: uh, garbage in, garbage out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. So if they don't have the correct data, yes. you're never going to get the correct yeah. answer. Yeah. Right. And and what we would point out is that there, essentially there's a knowledge problem. Yes. Right? Yes. There's no way that they, yeah. there's no way that could, they could actually have mm -hmm. the knowledge necessary to essentially, centrally plan the entire economy. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Where from the Austrian perspective, we feel that the, you know, and from my perspective personally, we feel that it's best that individual actors, mm -hmm. in, each individual knows best how to manage their own resources. Oh, true. So it's not, not, not so much government intervention. Yeah, well, well, each individual knows how, how best to run their own life, yes. how to allocate their own resources. Yes. And really what the Keynesians are doing and the government central planners yes. are doing, they're substituting their, uh, their judgment for your judgment. Yes. Right? Like, um, you know, they're debasing the currency. You're not, yes. uh, I'm not choosing to destroy my own purchasing yes. power. If I was, you know, I'd, I'd rather have, um, you know, an asset-backed currency, mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. Like, if, if I could be paid in gold, and spend gold, I'd, I'd rather that. You know, if I can be paid in Bitcoin, yeah. spend Bitcoin, I'd rather that. But so, sorry. So you would aggregate individually, not as society as a whole. You would well, I think I think you just have to build up from yes. the individual, yes. right? And you can't when you go to the macro level, you can't stop mm -hmm. because it all in the end, the economy is just individuals. Yes. Right. I mean, it's yeah. there is there. Are, you know, there are there are no aggregates out there, yes. right? And and I think the um, well. I mean, uh, as an abstraction, there's an mm -hmm. aggregate, but there actually is no aggregate. There's only individuals mm -hmm. buying and selling, trading, and, and, and what incentives do they respond to, yeah. right? How does the Austrian uh, School of Economics explain the financial crisis and how it happened? Uh, so the, what you're specifically talking about is the 2008 crisis? Yeah. yeah. Yes. So, well, and in fact, well, this is the thing. I'm actually, I mean, I'm, re I'm relatively new mm -hmm. to the school. Uh, yes. I mean, I think 10 years ago, I, I started reading uh, Adam Smith. Uh, oh, yes. Or I think like 2000, <laughs> or two, year 2000, I was started yes. reading Adam Smith and sort of started to get it. It was funny, I was during the tech bubble, um, you know, my, uh, my father sort of got me into investing. <laughs> you know, and so I made wow. some money. 
I made some, and it funny, I took my student loan actually and invested it in some yeah. stocks. So I made some money, I lost some money. Um, and uh, it, it, was, it was a very interesting thing. And, and so, so the way I came to it, and this is sort of in terms of explaining, you know, the 2008 crash, I mean, I sort of have to talk about my own perspective, right? Yeah. Because I witnessed this, um, I witnessed the tech stock bubble and crash. I was involved in it, you know, I was buying and selling things. And then I said, oh, what the hell? So I just sort of pulled off of investing for a long time. And uh, I ended up working in a, in a lighting company. So what we're doing was residential lighting. Uh, yeah. So it was designed here in Canada. Uh, mm -hmm. I was an industrial designer. I it was an industrial designer at that time. Designed here in Canada, manufactured in China. And I was, I was involved in sort of pricing, you know, pricing the lights and figuring out how we're going to sell them and, and shipping and costs and all this kind of jazz. Mm -hmm. So I, I got to know what was going on in China, and I got to see the way that, say, you know, 2004, 5, 6, you would see, I would see the price of zinc would just shoot up, mm -hmm. you know, would just yeah. go, the price of zinc would, sh would triple in, you know, a month or something like that, and, yes. you know, the price of oil go, is going up, oh, the, ship, the price of shipping is going up, the price yeah. of, uh, you know, the price of labor in China is going up, the price of all the goods and services mm -hmm. we need to buy in China is going up. You know, the, the Chinese are, uh, all the Chinese factories are, are having rolling blackouts because there's not, electri not enough electricity. So I got to witness, uh, I got to, and because I was working in residential lighting, um, essentially I got to witness the, um, uh, the effects of the housing bubble, yes. right? Because, you know, obviously when people build houses, yeah. they need lights for them. Yeah. And so, you know, we would be designing wall, wall sconces and chandeliers and all these sorts of different things. So, and... And so what I got to see from the inside was essentially this business cycle occurring, mm -hmm. right? And so I would go down to Dallas and I would see these new showrooms being built for these lighting companies because mm -hmm. we need, you know, there's all these houses being built. Yeah. We need to have these larger showrooms. Yeah. Uh, we're going to go to Vegas because they're building these yeah. grand new giant showrooms mm -hmm. in Vegas and whatnot. And so, uh, but when it all started to fall apart, uh, you know, uh, I started to look for answers mm -hmm. for it, right? And then so I started to, you know, I heard about Ron Paul. I heard people talking about gold. Um, I'd been sort of looking, I'd been uh, sort of doing some research in another area, looking in, in, as a total sidebar, the environmental movement yes. and, and those sorts of issues. Um, but, uh, but essentially, I, I happened upon a blogger, and he was sort of discussing the Austrian school. Yes. And, uh, so I, and then I sort of tracked back to Mises.org. Mm -hmm. So I started reading about what they were talking about, and uh, you know, I realized I said I've, I've been an Austrian my whole life, yes. and, didn't, and didn't realize it. And what I could also see is the way that the Austrian school explained the 2008 mm -hmm. housing crash, in that it was a, you know it was a, essentially you know a sort of a federal you know Federal Reserve induced uh, bubble essentially mm -hmm. right you know you had 9/11, you had the tech crash, you had guys like of course Paul Krugman yes. in 2000 I think it was 2001 or 2002 specifically calling for a housing bubble to be made, mm -hmm. to be created, which was hilarious. And now he'll, he'll try to deny it now, which, but it's all, the wonderful thing about the internet, of course, it's all there. Yes. You yes. dig back. So, um, so what I did was I was able to uh, look at what the Austrian school was saying about, you know, credit, you know, credit fuel bubbles, credit fuel business cycles mm -hmm. and central bank induced business cycles. And what they were saying about 2008, how, the, how that for years, people who were working in the Austrian school since they were predicting this outcome. And then I could see within my own personal experience working within an industry that was directly affected by the housing bubble, uh, it, all, it all just came together. Yes. And I realized, I, and then, and of course, stepping back and stepping back and stepping back, we look at the, and especially, well, I mean, ever since the Fed was created, but looking back, um, you know, since 1971, mm -hmm. you know, when the US dollar finally, you know, cut its final tie to gold, uh, these sort of, um, you know, every every couple of years we have another business cycle, we have another bubble, we have mm -hmm. another crash, yeah. and the, you know they seem to be just getting worse and worse and worse. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. So so using the Austrian framework, looking at the way that they talked about um, what what were the what were the creations of the housing bubble in terms of um, credit, in terms of uh, central bank intervention into mm -hmm. the uh, central bank intervention into the interest rate. And then also looking at the other government interventions, mm -hmm. looking at the, um, you know, the way that, that certain types of mortgages were encouraged, the moral hazard of things like federal, uh, federal deposit insurance, mm -hmm. right? Um, 
and the very fact that that looking back, uh, you know, over the last 40 years, you know, they've been they'd already essentially the federal government and the Fed had already been involved in yes. bailing out banks on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm sure you, yeah, I mean, you talked to Doug French, you probably talked about the moral hazard that's created yes. by that. But anyways, yes. but yeah, so <laughs> sort of a long winded answer, but uh, essentially, yeah. yeah, you know, from my perspective, and, uh, would be the the credit and you know credit induced yes. uh, business cycles yes. created by the Fed. And so, uh, who are your favorite Austrian economists and why? Um, well, you know, I, I read a little bit of everything, you know, like, and I, and I appreciate it all. I think probably, you know, uh, from a readability perspective, probably mm -hmm. Murray Rothbard is yes. very readable, so I enjoy that. Um, you know, and I think, and I, well, and I, the, the key, I don't know that I would name one specifically as my favorite, but, I, but I, what I like about the entire school in mm -hmm. general is just uh, is clarity of language yes. and the, the clarity of speech and mm -hmm. the, the fact that they're making clear logical arguments, right? Yeah, so yeah. essentially, you know what they're talking about, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and you can, relate to, you can relate to it in a real way. And I don't, and that goes right back to, you know, that goes right back to Carl, Carl Menger, mm -hmm. uh, Bob Verica, I haven't read too much of yes. him, <laughs> but you know, you're looking at Mises and whatnot. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, some of it can be a little bit uh, obtuse at times, or not obtuse, but, uh, you know, a little bit hard to understand at times. But, but in general, I found, you know, it's very clear and they're saying, well, okay, this, you know, X, you know, X yes. equals X, or, you know, two plus two equals four, yeah. not two plus two equals five. Yeah. So exactly. that's why I appreciate yeah. the, the Austrian school yeah, in general. Yeah. But, and, and of today's, and I mean, um, and, and, and sort of, and that's what I enjoy about it too. It's um, about, and also the modern Austrian writers, you mm -hmm. know, guys, you know, Bob Murphy and Tom Woods and, uh, you know, various, you know, Doug French mm -hmm. and all these people. What I also really appreciate about them as well is, you know, they just call it like it is. Yes. They're very clear and concise and say, this is the problem. Yes. This is what's going on. And it makes sense. Yeah. You know, exactly. it's, yeah. Yes. Okay, and how can someone get involved in helping the Mises Institute to meet these goals and objectives that you have mentioned? Okay, so, um, yeah, so what we're looking at now, um, so the Ludwig von Mises Institute of Canada, obviously mm -hmm. formed in 2010. Um, we're currently a registered charity, mm -hmm. um, which uh, hopefully I don't seem like too much of a hypocrite, yeah. but uh, you know, I figure as long as you're giving us some money, you might as well get some of your, tax, <laughs> some of your taxes back from the, from the government. Uh, yes. I think that's a, that's a good thing. So yeah, so obviously, uh, I mean, there's the obvious thing, you know, you know, we're a registered charity, so you know, we're looking for donations to help support our work. Uh, but otherwise, um, you know, we're looking for writers. Yes. Uh, we're looking for volunteers to help out with our events. Mm -hmm. Um, and whatnot. So, you know, visiting our website, spreading the word, sharing our videos, um, you know, do donating time and funds where where you can. Uh, these are all things that people can help to, uh, to help spread the word. Oh. And then the last question I just mm -hmm. want to know: What do you see the future of Mises Institute Canada? Uh, well, so far, since starting in two thousand and ten, mm -hmm. um, I think we've seen we've seen great growth. Yes. Right. Um, uh, because in some ways, uh, when I first, you know, when I first started the website, I think we probably, you know, I think we probably had 50 visits a week or yes. something like that, you know, and now we're up to, uh, you know, we're up to about 15,000 visits a month, wow. right? Yeah. So we've gone from about 200 a month to about 15,000 mm -hmm. visits a month. Um, essentially, every, uh, every, concert, every conference that we've had to date has been very well attended, mm -hmm. um, if not sold out. I think uh, our first conference that we had in Toronto uh, around monetary policy, Terence, uh, uh, Terry Corcoran of the, Na of the Financial Post walked in and was like, where did you find all these people? <laughs> so it's, yes. so uh, you know, in the age of the internet, these ideas are a lot easier to find. Um, and I think that uh, especially the younger generations coming up, you know, what they're seeing is they're getting in, you know, say they're graduating from university, there aren't the jobs out there, um, there might be economic problems, they're saying mm -hmm. what's going on, you know, why can't I afford a house? Yeah. Uh, you know, why are the baby boomers just uh, sucking all the resources? Yes. <laughs> so, and how to, and so, you know, people are looking for answers. Mm -hmm. And um, for the last, uh, during the 20th century, of course, uh, you know, there was the Eastern Bloc, the Iron Curtain, that a lot of the socialists and the, commun you know, the Marxists and the socialists within the West mm -hmm. could point to that as an example and say, well, look, it works, 
you know, see, you know, the central planning works. We just need more central planning. Mm -hmm. oh, we, we just, this free market yes. of ours, it's yes. just not working. It yes. doesn't, doesn't provide everybody with everything they need at all times, yeah. you know, which it can never do because of, you know, as Livio de Mises yeah. pointed out, in economic calculation of the socialist commonwealth, uh, you know, when you try to, when you eliminate prices, you simply can't calculate. Yeah. Um, so essentially, I think, I think especially the, the younger generation is coming up and they're looking at the problems that they're having and they're looking at, uh, around for answers. Mm -hmm. And the only, largely the answers that, well, especially say the socialists, but largely also the, the answers that uh, say a Keynesian mm -hmm. or a central planner who's teaching at, uh, a person who's in favor of central planning at a university, mm -hmm. or the politicians, essentially, they're just promoting more of the same. Yeah. Right? They're just saying, well, you know, we just simply didn't intervene enough into the economy. Mm -hmm. We simply didn't print enough money. Yes. We just need to double the money supply again, and that'll solve all our yeah. problems. You know, we'll just get everybody back yeah. to work. We'll just. Yes. And so, the, so these are the. Um, but you know, uh, since the creation of the Federal Reserve, that's been going on for a hundred years, mm -hmm. and it certainly, you know, I don't, you know, uh, it certainly hasn't made anything cheaper. Yes. Um, you know, we we now we now look at countries. You know, in Europe and Canada, we have, uh, you know, you might have had in, in 1900, even 1950, you've had almost no, you know, very low unemployment rates. Mm -hmm. um, and this, these were times during when there was much less government intervention. Yeah. You know, now we're having a situation where we have huge amounts of government intervention. Uh, we have these structural unemployment rates. Mm -hmm. We have all these sorts of issues that have been created essentially from the central planning of the last 100 years that's been implemented. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, meanwhile, we're looking at places like China and India, which are going in the opposite direction. I mean, I, I will agree China still has many problems, mm -hmm. but largely uh, China, since the late 1970s, has been going in the opposite direction, while the United States has become more centralized. Yes. China has, has been essentially relaxing its grip yes. on the economy, and we're seeing the results. Yes. You know, essentially hundreds of millions of people being lifted out of poverty, and there's no reason why that can't happen in the United States. It can't happen in Canada. Mm -hmm. um, we just need to have, uh, well, I mean, I don't know if the politicians will ever have the political will. Yeah. But, um, you know, people just need to understand and, and you know, and, and be able to protect themselves and plan for the future appropriately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you thank very you much. Nice yeah, for sure. Yeah.